kind of homesick for a country to which I've never, never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken and time won't matter anymore Beulah land I'm longing for you and someday on the I'll stand for there Just across that river to where my faith is gonna end inside. But there's just a few more days to labor. Bible reading will be from Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, somewhat lengthy portion, so you may remain seated. Daniel 6, starting in verse number 4, says this, says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then the presidents and princes assembled together to the king, and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Verse 8, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the uh, Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. 
Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went, went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near him and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. They answered, then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Verse 15, then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And the stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. And then the king went to his palace and paced the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Verse 19, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went to the, in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before the king, O thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then the king, exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. Well, Daniel was in a predicament, wasn't he? Now, I don't know about you, but I never did like the thought of being fed to the lions. That wasn't, I didn't relish the thought. How about you? But Daniel was a good man, and they couldn't find anything wrong with him. Now, the problem of it is, even good people who they can't find anything wrong with has enemies. There's people who believe in the Constitution of the United States of America. Amen. There's people who believe that we ought to live for, uh, that we ought to have a Christian country. I, they, uh, they have enemies. We live in a world today that I, I have enemies. There's people out there, believe it or not, that don't like me. That's true, Rick. They don't like me. I don't know why they don't like me. Um, but they don't. I've got nasty letters in the mail. You ought to see some of the nasty letters I've got in the mail. You ought to have been there the day I walked out there and opened the mail and there was a rattlesnake in my mailbox. You ought to have been there the day that a car tried to run me down and took out the mailbox when I was trying to get the mail out of the box. You ought to have been there the day when pornography showed up at my church. I mean literally filthy pornography, triple X, wicked, vile, filthy junk everywhere in my church. I pick it all up. Everybody has enemies. Jesus Christ had enemies. Daniel has enemies. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. So here's what they did. I want you to look at this. Verse number five. I want you to see the key here. Then said these men are these enemies of Daniel. We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law 
of his God. He believes in the one God of heaven. And let's make the king a God so there will be a division. Ladies and gentlemen, in this country we live in today, they are mad at God. They hate God. They despise God. And they are out to destroy those who love God. Now, in the story of the lion's den, you've known it and heard it ever since you was a kid. Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel was a good man, the Bible says. Couldn't find anything wrong with him. But there's one thing that he loved more than the king. And that was his God. You see, men have a problem. I seen a multitude of more people praying in the Capitol this week on their knees than the rioting people. I'm saying to you, when you hate somebody like these men did, they hated Daniel. They couldn't find any way to get to him or get him out of the office or get him... They couldn't find a way, so they had to come up with a way. Isn't that right? They had to come up with a way. A lousy frame up. You see, ever since man fell in Eden, the question has been, is God able? Fallen, wicked men, reasons that he can manage his own affairs. But he cannot. The God who created heaven and earth and the sea has not surrendered his omnipotence. He has the power, but we must furnish the faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. God is able to deliver his own from impending doom. There's a lot of people right now that are thinking, what's going to happen next? I bet you'd say I thought it. What's going to happen next? I've read history books. I've read how countries have taken over other, the country and made it socialist. I've read those in books. That's good books. Uh, that's the books before the now books. I'll show you how stupid this is. I, I helped my son do a history, on, I mean, do a paper one time. I told you about this. Took, took, took it right out of the history book. Took it right out of the book furnished by the library of the school. That teacher gave me an F. That offended me. That offended me. Took it right out of their book. Because they don't care about their books now. They care about their agenda now. But see, God is able to take care of problem areas. You know, see, God is so good that he can translate somebody from here to heaven. You you want to prove? Enoch. You want better proof? It hasn't happened yet? Rapture. You say, what's it going to be like in heaven? Let me give you a little picture of it. The Mount of Transfiguration. 
Try to grab a hold of that. Get a hold of that. Because you're going to recognize people. Just like the disciples or the apostles looked up and saw, look, there's Moses. Oh, look, there's Elijah. You're going to be able to see people. You're going to know them. You're going to know who they are. These people lived long before these apostles did, but they knew who they were. They want to make monuments to them. But in America, we realize that we can be protected like God protected Noah and his family. A lot of these countries I read about did not have what we had. That were taken over by socialists, did not have what we have. So they want to take it from you. But I'll tell you what I love all, not as much as I love God or the Bible or the church, because that's my life. That's, that's everything to me. But I'll tell you what I love right up there. It's called freedom. And I'll die before I lose it. They can shoot me. I don't care. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. To die is gain. Philippians 121. Amen. I don't like I don't like fighting, but I love freedom. Don't take it away from me. God is able to fulfill his promises. Now, let me just give you something, though, to think on. Does America deserve God's blessings? Pray not. Have we killed his creation? His babies? Yes. Have we murdered them in the first degree? Have we allowed sin that will corrupt the nation? Yes. Have we lost our desire for the Bible on the most part in this country? Has the church even tried to change the Bible? To say what they wanted to say. I had a lady tell me one time, she said, I don't like the King James Bible. I said, I, I, I like something I can understand. It makes more sense to me. Well, let me share something about the King James Bible. Now, I want to make this very clear to anybody that's in this room so you'll never forget this. This is like if kindergarten, or excuse me, let's go first grade elementary stuff, Okay? When you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of you. Amen. You become a partaker, the Bible says, of the divine truth. Amen. Jesus comes to live in your heart. These terms you've all heard. Is that right? The same Holy Spirit that lives here wrote the Bible. Amen. That's why the Holy Spirit and the Bi out there in the world, the Holy Spirit, that will be gone, by the way, at the rapture when you go, and the Holy Spirit that is in you go hand in hand, and you have no trouble knowing what the Bible has to say because the Spirit on the inside of you teaches you because it dwells. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. Amen. Now. Think about this. If the spirit does not dwell here. Will you understand the book that the spirit wrote? No. You can't read it. Makes no sense to you. Most people say I got to have a book I can understand. Get saved, you understand the book. 
You say, but I am saved. Make sure you're saved. Don't believe a devil's lie. You know you're saved because of how you live. I can't tell you if you're saved or not. I'm no judge. But I know I'm saved. But I don't know if you're saved. You say you're saved. Good. Then I will know you by your fruits. You see, here we are. We have a God who's able to fulfill his promise. Remember the promise that he made to Abraham? He made a promise. Now think about this. Now this is real hard to realize. Think about it. Think about it. I got to draw you a picture. God promised Abraham that his seed would take over all nations. He'd be the father of many, many nations. Okay. His seed was his son Isaac. He had other sons that may have stopped to start other nations, but only Isaac was to start Israel, the nation of God. Now, one day, come, here comes God. Here, here he had a baby, get this, of Sarah, who was right at 100 years old. Now, you women, any of you 100? How would you like to have a baby at 80? Well, you got some 80 years on here. But she was 100. In other words, that is a miracle birth. Somebody say amen. amen. My wife had all four of her children before she was 26 years of age. Now we're talking about having a baby at 100. <laughs> In fact, it was so ridiculous, she laughed about it. Right. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> well, I didn't hear that right. But she had one, a miracle birth, Isaac. Now, get this. Can I get this? Now God has told Abraham to take Isaac up on a mountain and sacrifice him to him. Now here's Abraham confused. Here's Sarah confused. Everybody's confused because out of Isaac was to come all these nations of all these people. Now God has told Abraham to kill him. Right. Sounded like to me that Isaac, I mean that Abraham was in a dilemma. What would you do if you were asked to take your only son up? And sacrifice him. Like God did. His only son. What would you do? I have four sons. When three of my sons was in the military. When they were in the service. I didn't want a military. I didn't want to see a military vehicle. Anywhere near my house. So here's what Abraham did. Now this is kind of ridiculous. This is unbelievable, isn't it? Now, he said, Isaac, get some wood and let's go up on top of the mountain. There's going to be a sacrifice today. He went to the mountain with his servants. Now here's what he said to his servants. Now think about this. He said, watch the animals here. Me and the boy shall return. Stop there. Why was he going up there? To sacrifice the boy. What did he say to his servants? We will return. What was 
Abraham demonstrating to the world there. Faith. He took that boy up on that mountain. He tied him down. The boy says, Dad, what, but, 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 but Dad, where's the sacrifice? And then Abraham said to his son, God will provide a sacrifice. In the meantime, he's tying him up to cut his throat. He went so far as to take the knife up here like this to kill his son because he knew. He knew that Isaac would be the father of all these nations. He knew it. He knew if he had to kill his son, God had to raise him back up. That's his faith. He brought his hand up and God stayed his hand. And over there in the thicket of the brush was a ram to be sacrificed. God provided the sacrifice. God wanted to know. Get this. God wanted to know how much faith he had. There's my son right there. I love him. Firstborn. Just like Isaac was. Firstborn. Mr. Sparks, that's your son right there. You're firstborn. Now God Almighty, the creator of the universe, has told you to take him up and sacrifice him. You see, Abraham was in a dilemma. We're in a dilemma in America right now. Amen? Amen. I want to know if our God is still the God that sacrificed, that is able to save Isaac. But now think with me. Does God... Want to save America? You see, I say this. God still loves obedience and godliness and prayer and holiness. Amen. Faithfulness. Do you know what God loves so much? He loves faithfulness. How faithful are you? Do you have God's back? He's got yours. Are you faithful? Dr. Jack Hiles was one of the greatest softball pitchers in the country. He had created a softball team in Hammond, Indiana that could not be beat. There was a championship game coming. No, excuse me. There was a championship coming. That's when he was a kid. He was a great softball player, but he had promised God he'd never miss church. One day the championship game fell on Sunday night. He was the pitcher. He said, I won't be there, boys. Why? It's a big game. It's a big game. Oh, it's a big game. Oh, it's a big game. He said, there's a big God that I promised I'd be in church. When he went to church that night, the whole team stood on the steps saying, please don't go in. Please don't go in. Please. He walked right into the church. The team lost. Dr. Jack House built the largest church in the United States of America. On one Sunday, one time, Jack Hiles had 130,000 people in Sunday school on one Sunday. 130,000, 28,000 more people than you can put in the Rose Bowl. Thousands upon, thousands upon, thousands upon people were saved that day. Never a Sunday or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night in the ministry in Hammond, Indiana, did Jack Hiles not baptize. What did God do for him? What did God do for Jack Hiles? He blessed his faith. There was nothing more important than God. I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, we've got in a world today in America that we have taken all the fine fancy things, all the doodads, all the, all the riches, all the money, all the fine things, and we have replaced God with them. While churches struggle on Sunday morning, Arrowhead is 80,000 people plus. They've taken Jesus out of Christmas. It's all about gifts. It's all about, it's all about uh, things. It's all about, but it's they forgot about the main gift. 
He provided a son for him. He provided protection in Egypt for him. He delivered Israel from the Egyptians' bondage. Do you see what God did? All those things he did for Abraham. When all his people were in bondage in, Abraham, in, uh, in Egypt, when they were down there making mud, when they were in bondage, when they were slaves, God remembered the faith of Abraham, who was willing to take the knife and destroy his only son. And then he sent Moses to deliver them. God's always got your back and hears your prayers. Every time. God is able to deliver his own from their human opponents. How about the fiery, how about the boys that went to the fiery furnace? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The three Hebrew children. They wouldn't do what they told them to do, so they put them in a fiery furnace. How would you like to go to a fiery furnace? No? I don't, I don't like fire. It hurts. I got scars all over my body right here. All over my arm from hot tar. I want to tell you what I want to tell you something about hot tar. I was carrying a bucket of hot tar on top of a roof Safeway store when I was young, and I hit the top of a stink pipe. You see, you know, the pipes that stick up there on the top of the building? My bucket hit that, whoop, and a, phew, a little bit of that tar popped up and come down on my nose. Oh, hot. Out of my nose. Immediately, tears started coming down my face. I mean, just because of the tar on my nose. And you don't want to touch it because you'll make it all everything. You sit there and check it. The three Hebrew, Hebrew children was put in a fiery furnace. And they turned the fire up so that it would make sure it would disintegrate them. You know why? They wouldn't bow down to the heathen. You going to bow? Well, what if they hurt me? They hurt Jesus. You better than him? Christians were hung in Nero's day as human torches because of their faith. You think God don't see all that? You see, God blessed America because of their sacrifice. Remember Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me what? He said, death. And the generation got a little more pansy. The next generation comes along and said, give me the liberty. And the next generation got a little more pansy. And now today's generation says, give me. Get your stimulus check yet? You get your 600 while the congressmen get their $40,000 raise? Are you happy? I don't, need, I don't want their money. I really don't. I don't need it. Do you know my grandmother was a poor little gal that raised four kids, five kids, Rita. She raised all five of us over there on 13, 26 South Dodge. Do you know grandma wouldn't take any help from the government? Wouldn't take a dime. She didn't have no money. All she got was her social security check from her and her dad's. Boy, you can live a long time on Social Security and live good. That's what they want you to believe. Then they want to, they want you to, and want you to praise them for letting you have it, which you earned to begin with, was your money to start with. 
You know what should happen in Social Security? Let me tell you how you should. The minute you start giving Social Security, it should be an account put in your name, and you should have every time Social Security comes out, you should go to that account, not to the government, but to the account for you that you cannot open up until 62. Then you have enough money to live on. How much, how, much, how much money? You know why they want to do that? Because all of the millions upon millions of people die at about 60. They don't have to give a dime to them. They spend their money. Ah, I got all kinds of things I can say today. It gets worse, by the way. We are in trouble in America because of our own choosing. Amen. I don't know how to say to pray. Pray for America like we should. Pray for our families like we should. Pray for our government like we should. Pray for our leaders like we should. And I think we should. But tell you, I want to tell you something. When our government endorses same-sex marriages, that is a spit in the face of our God. And he don't like it. What if God decided just to shut off your air supply? God is able to subdue all things unto himself. Now you guys listen to me. There's problems and there's trouble in paradise. I'm a Christian. A lot of people have not lived as long as you and, you and me and you. A lot of people haven't lived as long. I think of some great people that never lived as long as I have. George Washington died at 69. Stonewall Jackson died at 39. Jesus at 33. You can go on down the list of great men in this country that were patriots. Audie Murphy at age 53. On and on and down, people who died early. You're not guaranteed how long you're going to live. You may die tomorrow. Did Elvis Presley think he was going to die? No. How about John Lennon? No. How about John Kennedy? No. Boom, gone. But here's what I say. While we are facing turmoil and trouble, our faith should increase. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. Daniel's in the lion's den. Yeah, he's going to put me in the lion's den. Yeah, put him in the lion's den. And all they did is they looked down there and here's Daniel saying, nice kitty, nice kitty, nice kitty. They throw the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace. And they looked down and somebody was there with them, a fourth person that look like the Son of God. Amen. Yes, sir. Trouble's coming, but God's got it under control. Yes. Something, something, if God wants it to happen, will take place. You, your responsibility is to get on your knees and thank God for your family. Thank God that we live in America and pray that America will not disintegrate. That's your job. Now, if you go home today and you don't pray for your country, you'll find out why we are going in the wrong direction. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Lord, if you humble yourselves and pray, and seek God's face and humble yourself and repent of your wicked way. God said, I'll hear from heaven and heal your land. How many of you believe that? In fact, let me just close with that. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 in your Bible, please. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And look, if you please, with me. Chapter 7. Let me call you, this is what you'll call the recipe for revival. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Who wrote the Bible? 
Someone tell me. God did. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture, including this verse I'm about to read to you. Have you got it? Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. You got it? Here's what it says. God says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. What's the next part? And will heal their land. That's called the recipe for revival. But you know what? It ain't about God. It's about you. It's about us. It's about what we need to do. God don't have to do that. He created men and women the way he wanted them. He gave women what they desire of their heart, babies, not to murder, but to raise and nourish in the admiration of the Lord. He said out of the marriage plan, woman with man pursues child. Two men can't do it, two women can't do it. That's why you know it's wrong. You don't have to ask questions. It's wrong because it can't happen. Everything God creates, produces. Male and female created he them. Where are we at? Our country deserves this judgment. But God still loves you. That verse is still in the Bible. And it still works. If you go home tonight, get on your knees with that verse in your hand. Read that verse and pray, dear God, I repent. Heal our land. The Bible says he'll hear from heaven. Father, thank you for this day. For the blessings of life. For all that you have bestowed upon us. Dear God, help us in our time of trouble. Hear our prayer. Forgive our sins. Heal our land. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.